I have been doing a lot of volunteer work and business work um, in schools, and it's actually more than one uh, public school. And uh, just reminding me how hard teaching is, it's more than a couple days a week, and it puts you right back in the, in the groove of what teaching is all about, what good teaching, hopefully, is all about. And you know, I know that because I, I, I remember phrases I used to use when uh, my wife and I taught together for 10 years. Uh, that's where we met when uh, we were in our 20s. And uh, uh, we used to say stuff like, boy, having a bad class really sucks, but getting caught at having a bad class is the worst thing. Because most teaching is like baseball. You hit maybe 300, 320, 330. Some teachers are up in the 350 range. But you know, one in three classes really makes you feel great about what happened. And um, John Holt said, every administrator lives in, no, every teacher lives in fear that the administration is going to find out what's really going on in their classroom. And it's kind of true, because it's a very public thing, or should be. Um, it is. And uh, you're putting yourself on the line in a way that you know business people even don't put themselves on the line that often, except when they're giving PowerPoint presentations, and uh, or on the road, or you know in front of a large group negotiating or something. And we and we all get nervous about that. You know, most people say it's it's a fearful situation um, because you're really exposing yourself. Um, but what I want to talk about today. Um, is more philosophical than technological. Um, and I've always done that uh, since the first day uh, I, I hired Rick when he was four. Um, <laughs> he, was so, he was adorable. He, I think he was 23. And it's such a cute age. Um, but he uh, used to say, you know, when I'd go out and speak publicly, and he would get me to do it. He was like a mom, and you know, I'd go, oh, Rick, I don't want to do this, and he'd get me to do it. And then I would spend, I'd have an hour with 1,500 people or something in some city, you know, in Denver or something, and I wouldn't mention our product once, and I wouldn't mention te technology once. I would just talk about issues about the classroom and teaching. And uh, Rick got used to it and be began to see that it kind of worked because it's really, we are in the business of education. I think most of us, K through 12, that's our business. It's like that old trope, or it's not a trope, it's true that you know, when, in the 80s and 90s when we were reevaluating businesses, and we were saying, uh, we had to l learn lessons kind of like the railroad. The railroad company, for the longest time, it, companies thought they were in the real estate business or something because they had to buy so much track. And, you know, they thought they were in the money-making business because they were making so much money. They were in the transportation business, and it took them a long time to figure that out. And sometimes I do think that in the technology world, technology companies uh, and people who are peripherally involved, everything from you know administrators to lobbyists or whatever, just forget that we are in the education business. And it's a prescription for disaster. And that's why I like to keep things at a philosophical level, and also maybe slightly uh, controversial. Um, I used to think it was a strength of mine, you know, to say um, things to shake people up, and truly, it's just a character flaw. <laughs> you know, where I'm no fun at parties. Walking home from a party, I'll say to my wife, "And your job? I've told you this over again, and over again. Is to tell me to shut the hell up." You know, I just talk too much. Uh, okay, enough uh, preamble here. The situation today, I'd like to at least start with. Are you laughing about your husband? <laughs> I was laughing about the conversation. Oh. Okay. Yes, some of us do talk too much. Um, uh, I think a fourth hobby that Rick didn't mention is that I am an abusive reader. Um, and I started around 1989. I didn't do well in college. Um, I went to good college, Swarthmore, but I didn't do well. And I started reading voraciously. I'm now in a book group. Uh, but before I was in a book group, I was thinking of joining like a support group you know, for, 
for people who read too much and or can't stop reading. And I do read voraciously about education. Also, another thing I'll throw out there, just I invite you all to do this. I read a liberal political book, and I read a conservative political book. And I read a liberal one, and I read a conservative one. And it makes me very well-rounded and pretty much un unhappy with any group I'm ever with. Um, <laughs> Because I just find them all to be stupid. Um, um, the situation today, there is a barrier uh, that I'm going to propose to you. And I think more and more, hi, Maria, I'm sorry. I just see someone from years ago. Um, uh, everybody has different theories and notions, as you know, if you read the paper or you read literature about education and, you know, it's open season on education because things are very confused right now. But um, I see an emerging pattern that I'd like to share with you. Um, so I was writing some notes this morning and this is the way I sort of outlined it. There's a barrier uh, to the winning path for good things. That was my first line. And I underlined good things so I could define what I mean by good things. Here's a basic set of what I think good things are in our business of education. And I'll say them kind of in an inverse order to be outrageous. I think high test scores are part of our business. Good test scores. I have no problem with that. I love it. And I like keeping schools accountable and teachers accountable, and kids accountable. There's no substitute for it. Another good thing is college acceptance. Uh, it's good for many, many kids, maybe not all, but it's a great goal. Another good thing is personal and professional success and satisfaction in life. Uh, and that, those three things as a package go together uh, nicely. So we can say those are three great aims for education. Uh, I didn't put in there as an aim for education pre-algebra. That is subsumed under the rubric of all this, you know, the other stuff. Um, so the path to these good things, because I said there's a barrier to the path to these good things. The path that's highly accepted by um, all persuasions, I would say, politically and culturally about education is critical thinking, critical thinking in a public forum that's repeated over and over again, especially recently when people are talking about 21st century skills, verbal skills, shared discussion ability, being able to ask good questions, being able to participate in a Socratic learning situation. And by Socratic, it's, it's a constant question and answer. Um, those are some of the things on that path. Uh, without which, it's very hard for students to advance and to get into college and to be successful in business or to graduate from high school and be successful in business. And you could argue that it's even hard to succeed in a trade or in, le in, in something less than you know, a, a senior plumber um, if you don't have all these skills that we just mentioned, the critical thinking and being able to ask good questions and being able to discuss things publicly and being able to share with colleagues and professionally, et cetera. So they're good things, and those, that's the path to getting them. And then I said there was a barrier on this path toward these good things. The barrier is the, is the interesting hook here, because there's so many different ways to frame the problem. And this is, this is what I think is the most efficient way the, and the most uh, direct way for us to think about where to go. The barrier is the disappearance of a teacher's main asset in the classroom. And that is student attention. And there are reasons why this is disappearing. And I'd like to talk about that in a moment.